Welcome back, Time Crunch fans. I'm your host, Coach Adam Pulford. Just a quick prequel to the next two episodes before I get going today. John Kroom is a CTS coach, former elite track racer, and has got stories upon stories to share about his athletic journey that we can all learn from. He's now competing at the top level of sailing in the 37th edition of the America's Cup. And there's some secrecy around design and technology that's comparable to Formula One racing. As a result, John had to be pretty careful about how he answered some of my questions, but there's still a ton of great insight and information for fans of sport and human performance in these episodes. In particular, I think you'll be inspired to keep pursuing athletic goals, no matter the naysayers. You'll learn how to build anaerobic capacity and have a better appreciation for how a solid aerobic system can transfer to so many other things in life. I want you to hear a story on how someone can change their body from a heavier team sport athlete into an endurance machine, then use that fitness in the concepts learned along the way to apply it to whatever you really want to. More specifically, I want to introduce you to CTS coach, John Kroom. John, welcome to the show. Hey, yeah, no, thanks for having me. I'm an avid listener, not just because I work here, but um, I am a listener. Um, just got to check man. in on the crew every once in a while, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. Uh, well, good. I'm, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you listen and, um, I'm glad to have you on the show. I mean, I, th I think even like a couple of years ago, you talked about it and it's finally coming to fruition, um, now because your, your life always takes some zigs and zags, which we'll, which we'll talk about. Um, for sure. I thought <laughs> cycling was the weirdest thing I've done, but, um, it gets weirder, man. It gets weirder for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So for, for those who are on the edge of their seat right now, and they may not know you or follow you on the socials, what the heck do you do, John? Uh, I'm a, it's weird saying, but in technicality, I'm a professional sailor um, by trade. Like, by uh, trade. yeah, stuff <laughs> so by trade. Um, sailor by day, coach by night kind of thing too? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, I'm a professional sailor with American Magic um, for a challenger for the 37th America's Cup. Which, when you say that, is it's pretty wild. Um, it's yeah. pretty wild how I got here as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is super weird, and we'll, you know, we'll get into that wild story. But as I alluded to, this this episode is to set up um, more of the actionable stuff later. So we'll have some storytelling here and um, actionable stuff later. But as John tells his story here. I'm sure he'll drop some of those knowledge bombs that we can all learn from. And then in our next episode, um, you know, I call him the Clydesdale hero because you'll, you'll hear more about uh, why that's true, but he'll help you to um, apply some concepts about anaerobic capacity then. So uh, let's dive in, Kroom. Tell yeah. us, tell us your background. Cause I know you uh, came from a team sport uh, background, similar to myself, but yeah, then you picked up the bike. Tell, tell us, how that happened? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess in high school, like I and and honestly, as a kid, I I always played football. It's really an easy thing to go to when you're a bigger bigger guy. Um, and then I, the hard thing about football for me was I was just good at it, and I felt like I was just good at it because I was overweight. I was always an overweight kid. Um, I think I remember weighing myself in Dustin, Florida. I was on spring break with uh with in middle school um and like the grandmother that we were staying with had a scale and i weighed myself and i was 210 pounds and and i was just like i mean seventh grade how old are you in seventh grade like yeah what seventh grade 12? i don't know yeah i, I don't even know yeah so 12 <laughs> yeah. Uh, or something like that i mean i was young i remember being 180 pounds in the fifth grade as well and i was i was that's like yeah under under 10 years old yeah um, and, and I was just gaining weight constantly and I wasn't eating well. Um, but I always played football. Right. And crazy thing was you were, I was an offensive lineman and you just kind of stood there. There was like, I didn't, I always wanted to play quarterback, but like, instead of like the coach being like, Hey, you're too big and you're too slow. It was just like, ah, oh, this isn't a good spot for you. You should try this. And, and I would always get moved into something else. And so then shortly thereafter, I was just like, oh, I got bored of that. And I started to get into wrestling. And then I got into wrestling and and then I realized I wasn't, I almost wasn't strong enough. I was a JV wrestler and I was wrestling against a guy that was like 215 pounds. I was used as a training dummy as in JV and, um, and literally because I was heavy, I was like two, I had to cut weight 
to make heavyweight. So you, you to make heavyweight, you have to weigh under 285 pounds. I don't know if that's still a thing, but it was it is, then. It is still a thing, yeah. And so I, I remember at my heaviest, I was 305. Um, and I would have to cut weight to make heavyweight. And I was okay. Um, but that didn't last long when one of the bigger gentlemen who was like 3% body fat and like 217 pounds, like dislocated my knee in a training exercise. And I was just like, yeah, this isn't for me. <laughs> and, uh, and honestly, I, I just rode a bike everywhere. Um, and I hung out with like the hip cool crowd and, um, I was on a fixed gear and Oh, riding around super yeah hard. i was so hip i was uh, yeah just picture john at 305 pounds trying to fit himself in some tight jeans yeah. and going to like concerts and house shows and that was a uh, that was an interesting time in my life but we won't dive into that we're talking about sports john uh, <laughs> where, where where was this crew where, where did you grow up again uh rock hill south carolina okay. which is like right outside of charlotte um yep. and around this time this is like my senior year in high school everybody's like trying to figure out colleges and what they want to do. And I didn't really have anything like football, like sport was kind of it, but I didn't put enough effort into sport to make it it. Um, and so then I just got into the cycling. Uh, I went into a bike shop and I just bugged the bike shop every day about parts and, and I got really into it. And shortly thereafter, I ended up getting a job, begged to get a job there and um, found out there was a velodrome getting built in my city. And, um, big guys were allowed to do that. Like that was the part of cycling culture that like, it was socially acceptable for bigger guys to do. And I remember having a chat that I was like, going to do my first race. And, um, they were like, oh man, you are way too big to do that. Like you like you way too big. And I was like, you just, you just watch me, man. I'm going to go out there. It's like, how hard can it be? These guys shave their legs, they wear underwear and they ride around in a circle. Like how hard can it be? And little did I know, like in 2013, when, you know, after I've seen this track develop for two years and they had a couple cool races and like brought out some pros like Bobby Lee and these Olympians, Jamie Carney. And uh, little did I know that I'd be racing these guys in like eight years time um, and even trying to go for an Olympic bid. But yeah, long story short, um, I was too big. <laughs> and uh, in, in the course, I ended up losing weight and the funny thing is, is I've played this weight battle for, I don't know, my entire cycling career. I was either too big or I lost too much weight, which lost too much power. And I, I, I battled the weight game for a long time, which we can talk about if you want to at a later time. But yeah, long story short, that's kind of how that transition happened. It was pretty much somebody being like, hey, you know, you're way too big to do this. And mm -hmm. um, more or less, like I kind of took it as a challenge and um and the cool thing about cycling is it didn't come easy to me like football or wrestling. Um, it didn't, I didn't latch onto it as quick. Um, and so I actually kind of got addicted to that. I got addicted to, um, the fact that you had a losing record nine times out of 10. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you kind of were never done. Like there was never, no. there was always the next event that was bigger. Like you were doing one event to get to the next event. Like, whereas like in, high school it was just like yeah you're trying to get to college but that might not happen like you you didn't really have control over that whereas i have control over my upgrade points kind of well actually i do and then on top of having that control then i have control of the races i can register for um and it just snowballed and and i and and like i said i think i remember i remember coming home and telling my parents because i was still living at home at the time because i couldn't figure out college and um i was like i want to go to the olympics in cycling and they were like you've done one race and i was like i was like yeah i want to go and then i remember telling my dad i was going to shave my legs and that was a whole battle of like he's like are you sure you want to do this like you sure you want something you want to get involved in and i'm like yeah i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it i'm all in and like it just like went all in and uh yeah it's crazy <laughs> it's uh but w what i've learned though is that's kind of your personality right yeah. Um, my wife, my wife definitely struggles with it. Um, because it, it, it's like with everything, um, I get really excited about something and the next moment I'm like studying it, trying to learn it, trying to get into it. And 
it's it's a good and bad thing but <laughs> yeah it's 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 kind of like that that river that's flowing it just needs to be channeled properly otherwise it can lead to some very, other outcomes very much and luckily i've had i've had some decent coaches over the years and mentors and friends who've who've helped me channel um channel some of that but like i said i'm always overflowing and going all over the place so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah well let's i, I mean i kind of want to actually kind of press into the cycling aspect there too, because yeah. you went on to become an elite uh, track cyclist and making yeah. a bid for the Olympics. Uh, but as you said, 300 pounds, bigger dude, you didn't do that overnight. So yeah. for, for our listeners who, who want to hear more about that or kind of make a, a healthy body change, um, what role did just aerobic riding play in that. I mean, you probably had to change some nutrition. You had to change your training. You had to make some pretty big shifts there. So let's, let's talk about some of those aspects because myself coming from a team sport background, football, wrestling, um, and all the likes kind of chose a different sort of, uh, the, the whole eating disorder and the yeah. you know, addicted to training and all that. I'm sure there's probably some threads in that in there. Unfortunately. Um, yeah, for sure. Unfortunately. Yeah. So yeah. like I I'd say let's hear the good, the bad and the ugly um, yeah. of how your journey came to be kind of that elite rank and then we'll go to sailboat racing. Yeah, no, I, I honestly think, I honestly think it started, um, it started out kind of poor um, because of my personality. Um, mm -hmm. it's weird. Cause like my parents, like in the beginning, they were just like, you get so invested in things, but then you just stop doing them like you. And that's kind of where they thought the cycling thing was going to go. And honestly, they probably weren't wrong in, in thinking that like I was in bands that were going to go touring and I was in, um, I was involved in like photography and I was like into all these things. And, um, I never, I never really stuck with it. Like I did cycling and I don't, I don't really necessarily know why I chose cycling. Um, maybe it was cause I was by myself, but, um, I was like living on my own finally. Um, and so long story short, like the, the nutrition thing did change. It was like, I started to realize there was something different about me than everybody else. And I wanted to be the best in anything I did, like any event. So it was like, I would beat the juniors at the weeknight, you know, cat five, right? I didn't care. I, don't, I did not care. I'd beat the master's guy. I did not care. I just wanted to win. And I, I liked the feeling of winning. Um, but I started to realize there were some things holding me back, um, especially on the road. And what I started to realize is that if I really wanted to go further, I needed, I needed some road exposure. Like I needed, I was like watching United Healthcare at the time. This was like when, you know, the crit scene, like they had the blue train, the blue train was the coolest thing I had ever seen in my life. And, um, and, 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 and then you had like Optum and those guys battling against each other. And it was just so cool. And I was like, one day I want to ride for Optum so I can go against the blue train. I had so much respect for the blue train, but I wanted to ride for Optum. Um, and because they had track guys like, you know, you know, and, and that was, that was the thing that got me excited about cycling. And, um, but I was like, what's the difference? And, and, um, I would say, uh, probably a guy that I looked up to was Brad Huff. And unfortunately, Huffster. Yeah, I, love that guy. I, I really looked up to him because he, 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 was, he was this bigger dude in the sport, came from football, the whole thing, kind of a similar thing. And unfortunately, he told his story and I took it as like, oh, that's, that's kind of what I needed to do to get there. And I wouldn't necessarily say that like, oh, like that's what kind of triggered me into doing that stuff. It was just like, I need, I need to be the best. Like, and so I was talking to other pro cyclists at the time that I was hanging out with and like, what were they doing? And they were doing five hour rides fasted. They were doing these, all, all these things, um, not eating. Um, and so I'm like a cap four, three, like pretty much starving myself, riding the rollers in the morning, like ridiculous things, like things that like actually like looking back on, like, oh man. And, and, and honestly, like the culture has so shifted so much, like carbohydrates, like keto is just becoming a thing like in carbohydrates. Like we didn't have scratch labs. We didn't have all these things that like the ride nutrition, nobody really talked about not ride nutrition like they do now. Um, and, and so I just assumed you didn't need it. And so I didn't, 
Um, and I, and I got, I got pretty light and I got by pretty light. I got to like 200 pounds, so um, lost, uh, like a hundred pounds from this, the start of this process. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. In a, how long? I'd say by 2015, I think it took me about two years. Cause it was like an yeah. on and off thing. Like I was pretty, I tried to like live college life and, and do that thing. Like, and, and you know, that's one thing I skipped, like. I had an opportunity, like a buddy of mine saw me at the track and I was racing and he was like, if you want to keep racing, you should go to college and race. Cause that was also a new thing. It was like racing in college and, uh, Kyle not, um, introduced me to a coach at Mars Hill university. And they were like, Hey, just come on here. And like, I don't, there wasn't any scholarship or anything. And I, I went to Mars Hill as a cat four and left as a cat one and everything. And, and it, it was cool. It was a cool opportunity to, to kind of get involved in cycling and race more. Like I didn't have much money. And so like, it was kind of nice to just have the opportunities to just race. And you were racing against the best at the time. I mean, that was like, you know, the Hincappy boys were all at Furman at the time. And uh, the Marion guys were pretty much their own pro cycling team then as well. And uh, yeah, it was, it was something that I envied. And so like all these guys that I looked up to, I was finally getting to race against. And because in college, it was always a one, two, three race. And so like, I'm now brushing elbows with these guys. I kind of, I guess, want to be. Um, and so you continue to fast forward. And I started to realize that the, my powers falling off, my sprints falling off. I'm highly fatigued. Like I can't even get out of my own way. Uh, bonking in rides, like no other, like dizzy. Like, and, and I started to read more books. I, I mean, even like listening more, like, I guess it wasn't podcast really, but I was listening to more things about pretty much pro cyclists saying that they've done this. It's a bad way to go about it. You should try something different. And so then I hired a nutritionist and I, I ended up playing this game of this like wishy-washy, like keto, high fat diet fasted but low carbohydrate and it it worked for me and i know this works for other people um or the people claim that it works for them and it it, it was one of those things that just like i felt better because i was eating again um but i just still felt like i wasn't a hundred percent and at that point i never felt a hundred percent and uh then I, then I, then I actually like, um, I hired a nutritionist, um, outside of cycling. Like I just went away from cycling and I hired a nutritionist that was like into CrossFit and, uh, bodybuilding and all these other things. And I was pretty much telling him like what I was doing. And he was like, dude, you need more carbohydrates. Like yeah. he's like, you need like especially how big you are, like you should be doing like a hundred grams of carbohydrates per hour on these three hour rides. And there's like a bicycling magazine article where like I lost like another, it was like, cause I gained 30 pounds back when I started to eat again. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, you couldn't really tell, but I was like skinny fat. Like I was just like pudgy. Mm -hmm. Um, like I had, I had like pretty toned legs, but I just had like this, I still had this like gut. And I honestly, I just told myself, I was like, Oh, this is, this is like that pre-existing fat that I had, you know what I mean? Like it just won't go away. Like right. that's just, and so then, <laughs> so then I meet this, I meet this nutritionist. He's sending me down this road of like more carbohydrates and actually lowering the fats at times. And so you would time it and everything was timed and you would eat, you know, an hour and a half before. And I was like, Oh man, like I had never eaten an hour after my ride. And I started, wow. I started doing this game and like playing this game. And then everything started to come out with like studies and, you know, people pretty much talking about carbohydrates and literally my FTP shot up through the roof, my, right. along with my VO2. Like I thought at that time, like, oh, you're either good at 20 minutes or you're good at sprinting. Like that's kind of how my thought process worked. And, and just as quick as, you know, rim brakes and cable shifting went away it was kind of that same thing. Like keto was gone. Fasting was gone. Carbs, 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 carbs. Like, and 
man, I, I wasn't eating the best carbs always on the ride, but it was good because it like, then I wasn't eating them at nine o'clock at night because I didn't really feel like I didn't want them like, uh, because I was full. Like I wasn't like, wasn't like fiending for them, you know? And so, um, <clears throat> anyways, long story short, I then had the first, like the first ever time I've had a six pack was that time. And I felt great. I weighed like 210 pounds and I had a threshold over 400 Watts and yeah, so yeah. it was pretty nice. <laughs> that's, that's it, man. And I think a good way to summarize all that is a quote from, I think Jim Lehman. I remember him telling me, when I was a young coach and we were having like some of these debates on uh, proper fueling and all this kind of stuff where and we were saying 2005 um, uh, carbohydrates are the way. And I think it was Jim that piped up. He's like fat burns in a carbohydrate flame. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Right. And it's, and it's crazy. Cause it's like, it's something so simple that we made so complicated. Yeah. Um, really complicated. Like we do on a lot of things. Humans. It's so, it's, it's just kind of like losing weight. And that's another thing that I started to realize that like, honestly, I felt like, you know, food for thought for the listeners, like something that really helped me with my weight loss and something that really helped me understand food and nutrition a little bit better is, is consistency is key first off. And then the second thing is it's not rocket science. It's, it's literally just less calories in expended kind of situation. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, and making sure that you're metering that. Like it, it's not like, oh, if I do 3,500 calories because that's a pound of fat, if I just negative 3,500 calories in a day, then I've lost a pound of fat. That's where the consistency is key comes back in. Yeah. Um, and so watching that, tracking that, and honestly, I, I, I think if anything that I can say, three months is the longest and shortest time you'll ever spend losing weight, but it's the craziest thing to go through because it feels so long. And then once you get to the end of it, you're like, Oh man, it's been three months. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, based, based on Kroom's story here and for our listeners um, kind of chiming in here, some of those things that we're talking about is, you know, when, when you starve your body of any macronutrient, fat, protein, carbohydrate, you're going to have problems. So you need to have the blend of all three. Additionally, when you're an endurance athlete and you're, uh, pumping through and you're doing group rides and you're doing intensity and things like this, you're going to need carbohydrate for a primary fuel source. And that's what John's journey is really showing that, right? And as soon as he got that shored up in proper dosages, now he could start to move the needle in a healthy way. And then finally, you know, I would say, um, weight loss three months, right? You say, well, why is that? You're establishing a new like homeostasis and it sucks because your body just wants to be the same no matter what it is now. So you need to induce that. But once you've changed it, what you did in order to change it is not what it takes to keep the change as the new normal. For and sure. That's what he's saying. For sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. That's really well summed up. I think, I think it, it is key to, to kind of understand that like, you know, even in the process, let's say that you're playing the fasting game and you just want to try maybe some carbohydrate game and, maybe go down that route or, or you know, you're going to try dieting. It, it really takes a few weeks to, for you really to start to feel the effects of it. I think, especially if you've been in such a glycogen depleted state for such a long time, yeah. it, uh, it can make a difference. But I, I, I honestly think that like you are literally putting gas in the tank for the next workout. And the way I, the way I view some of so the way I view eating is, is literally gas going into the tank. And so like it, and, and that's kind of how that guy helped me look at working out and doing these things is more or less, you know, when you were, when you were putting that, those calories in, those are calories going to get expended, but you know, that's so I can do that zone two ride that much longer, or I can do that sprint that much longer. And you're just, mm -hmm. so the gas tank isn't on E, you know, driving a car on, a light tank is probably not the best way to go, you know? Yeah. No, that that's it. And, and for any listeners who want more on, on the nutrition thing, um, I mean, I've done a, a ton of podcasts with uh, Kristen Arnold, um, Nicole Rubenstein. So you can look for those names in, in the podcast. And we, we go over some of this like nutrient timing, um, the carbohydrate, uh, 
kind of push of sorts, but the timing of that as well. And I would say, look at those podcasts for a little bit more. But the reason I want to talk about here with Kroom is because his journey, especially like a lot of misinformation, especially like a bigger person seeking all the wrong things, like kind of, you came up in a time, John, where it was like, like I said, tons of misinformation and we were just starting to figure out and like, Alan yeah, Lynn I was on the tail end of it. Yeah, you were hundred yeah. percent. I was on the, I was on the tail end of it. And I, I, I still think, and like, if anybody gets anything out of this podcast, it's like the amount of times I have athletes have me on the phone and they're like, oh, if I could just lose five more pounds, I'd be this much better. And I was like, well, if you could just gain 20 more Watts, you'd be this much better. If you could be this much more arrow, you could be this much better. And you know, I, I've won nationals at 110 kilos and I've won nationals at 93 kilos. There's no difference. I got to stand on the podium box twice. You know, the only thing that was different was my weight. And so at the end of the day, like, you know, trust your body, let your body do its thing um, and train for the effort that you're wanting to do. And I do understand that there is a Watts per kilogram game in this sport that we do, unfortunately for a guy like me, Mm -hmm. Uh, it does exist. Um, And there might be a ceiling on your, on what you can achieve going uphill or, or what have you. But I, I would recommend there's, there are places in cycling that I feel like go on tap sometimes for certain body types. Um, and, and, and you can, you can definitely, you can definitely use your body type to your advantage. I've seen skinny guys win crits. I've seen big guys win crits like it, they, but they've won it two different ways. And so we just have to figure out you as an athlete and your body and then get you across the line fueled, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So as we, as we just kind of transition from, cause we'll touch on points too, about more on fueling and, and, and weight and stuff, but like, tell me, cause I don't even know this story of how you went from uh, beating up on the juniors and the cat fives to being recognized. And then all of a sudden on the U S national team. So t- tell us kind of expedited story about that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I give a brief, brief one. Um, honestly, um, opportunity, like it was, it was a really big thing. I was, I was looking for any opportunity to race. Like I would have packed my car. I've like packed my car up and drove 15 hours, um, to go to Indianapolis just because that was the only track race that I saw on the calendar that I was allowed to start as a cat three and I needed points to get to a cat two. And I did, I did whatever it took to, to get my upgrade. Um, and in that process, you, you obviously you meet people and, and then that grows into opportunity. And honestly, like I, I, I went down, to, I was lucky enough to live in Rock Hill and I could bounce to Atlanta and Atlanta had like some pro track series. So like guys from Florida would come up and like Jamie Carney and they would invite people and I'd meet these people and race with these people and they would, they pretty much just put in a word for me. And I just never said no. Um, to any opportunity I had. And that all went to Guy East, um, you know, fast forward a little bit. Um, my first ever real race, I um, I emailed Guy East when he was doing the six days. And I was like, what, like, what does it take to get in the six day? And it's funny, like knowing that now, um, I could only imagine how many emails he's had from somebody being like, what, how do I get here? And he's just like, go, just go email promoters and go. So I was emailing promoters, was doing everything I could. And I think I emailed the promoter and the promoter messaged Guy East and was like, hey, do you know this guy? He says he wants to come. And, you know, I was going to bring you as the American. And and Guy called me personally and was like, hey, man, do you just want to ride it with me? I was like, yeah, 100%. He's like, you got to figure this out. You gotta... I was like, I don't care. I'll figure it all out. And like, I, I, next thing I know, I was in Italy racing a six day with Guy East and Viviani and Filippo Ghana. And it was, it was unreal. Guy and Mark, East was yeah. a CTS athlete as well. Uh, quick side note. Oh, didn't even know that. That's yeah. kind of cool. And so it was, it was a, it was a cool opportunity. And so that kind of like kickstarted my career because people started to see me doing that. And um, it kickstarted me into other things. And, you know, then I'm getting invited to go to T-Town and race, um, race some of the Madisons in T-Town and that grew. And so long story short, um, I then get a phone call in 2000, 2015, I think. And then 2016, after the Olympic games, 
um, I had messaged Andy Sparks a few times and uh, I was like, what do I need to do? Like, what do you need to like, give me a number. Um, and he never, he never, he would always just like, give me these like shoddy numbers. It was like, do 300 Watts for three hours. Um, do this for this. And you know, your pursuit time needs to be X. And so like when the pursuit time was X, it was really hard to chase. Um, and then finally he like sends me an email and he's like, Hey, we're going to start a team pursuit program. Like, do you want to come? Um, and that was in 2017. And then after that, I went to every single national team camp, even not at my best, the every single national team camp with Jim Miller. Um, and, you know, Jim Miller was probably a huge one for me as well, because Jim Miller is a hard guy to get on with in the sense of as an athlete, like, and honestly, like you, you immediately think that like, oh, he just wants to work with the best of the best. And I, I don't think that's a hundred percent true. He wants to work with the people that want to work. Yeah. And there was multiple times where Jim Miller could have let me go. There was multiple times where Jim Miller could have been like, you're not good enough. Like looking back on it now. And he always invited me. And that's because I packed up and I moved to Colorado Springs. And I was like, I'll be here. I'll be at every track session and I'll be the first, like first one in last one out, whatever you need me to do. And so I actually thank Jim Miller for that. And like, we've had hard conversations <laughs> uh, back and forth a hundred percent. And, but I, I do thank Jim Miller for a lot of the opportunity. And honestly, that's it. Long story short is any opportunity I had, I, I again, went to that extreme, took it to that extreme and just, just did it. Um, whether or not I did it well or did it right. Um, I did it. And then there was somebody who appreciated it. Mm -hmm. And then that somebody gave me my next opportunity. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, it's a good, that's a good summary. And I would agree with you on Miller. Uh, he's been on the, he's a good friend. He's come on the podcast a few times and a lot of people think that all he cares about winning and uh, he doesn't. He does. Well, he I, loves I, to I win. Do too. I love yeah, to yeah. win too. You know, yeah. it's like, and, and, and I mean, at the end of the day, what are we doing here? Like, you know, we're trying to go to the Olympics. We're trying to win. And, and there has been a few times where we've had that conversation, but he, he does, he knew that I wanted to win too. And I think even though I wasn't the best and I wasn't your typical athlete and I wasn't on paper, like if you looked at me on a sheet of paper, my weight, my power, mm -hmm. my Watts per kilogram, mm -hmm. my VO two max, like I wasn't, I wasn't your guy. Yeah. But he still believed in me enough because I had the heart and the mindset, and that's what I appreciated. Yeah, and and I think to, to all this point, and in my point with Miller, because I do think he gets a little construed when when we're talking about like the, those Olympic champions and stuff. He gets yeah. he gets he understands that in order to win, it's about the process, and a harder worker yeah. will prevail so long yeah. as they are. Um, checking those boxes along the way because I have athletes too that um, they don't look good on paper, but they win bike races. I have time crunched athletes who, you know, they don't have the time, but they get it done. And then they get yeah. results because we're testing, we're going, we're going to the races and it's that process. It's that journey that just kind of like sucks in yeah. the, like the moment. Right. For sure. But then you get those little like, outcomes you get those races you get those wins you have the moment where you actually like put it all together and that's what's so cool about the process of it and i would say for for our listeners who can resonate with that uh i'm i'm sitting here too i was never the star athlete i, I was actually yeah. i was an overweight kid too um uh growing up and and um i've talked about that a little bit on the podcast but i always had to work way more than others in order to get yeah. something done um and I think it's, it's both like the, uh, it's, it's the curse and the blessing in it, because then you can apply it to other things in life. And that's where kind of what we're talking about right now is like, how the hell did you get to become uh, a sailboat racer through this like zigzag journey? And I think it, it's, it's, it's in that story right there where you're, sure. I love winning. I always took opportunity. I always worked my ass off. So tell us. For, How the for sure. Sailboat racing. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, speaking about hard conversations with national team coaches, it, it's a funny thing, man. Like, and you'll, you'll hear it up and down. Um, you know, it's hard, man. It's hard trying to go for the Olympics and it's hard 
trying to chase a dream with little to no support. And by support, I mean, just like financially, and you're trying to like be a normal human and have a family. And, you know, I have a wife who pretty much did whatever I needed to do (laughs) to make this dream possible. And, and, you know, I, we're still paying for it now. Like I literally, like I put that stuff on credit cards and, um, and you know, she doesn't even bat an eye. She's like, that's, but that was our dream. Like that's, that was our dream. Like seeing you at the Olympics would have made me just as happy as you being there. And that's something special. And so, you know, how do we get here is like, I, I started to think, you know, I'm coming on, I think I was like, I might've been 29 at the time. And a comment was made to me that I was getting old. Um, there was a new national team coach and he's like, yeah, we think we want to go a different direction. And so unless you're completely dominating, like we want to give the young guys an opportunity and you might help qualify the spot, but we want to give these young guys an opportunity. And I took it kind of hard. Um, but I actually looked at my wife and I said, Hey, you know, this is December of 22 and, uh, or no, it's December of 21, uh, 2021. And I, I looked at my wife and I was like, Hey, like, I'll know if I'm going to the Olympics, like there's kind of a weird thing in cycling where you kind of have an idea of like, if you're in the running by, you know, about two years out. And so that would have been middle of 2022. And, uh, literally two weeks later, I get an un, like almost like a private number and I get this phone call and I answer it like, hello. And it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Like I'm this guy with, uh, I'm Jim Martin. And I'm like, Jim Martin. He's like, yeah, yeah. I work for this university, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, why are you calling me? Like, is this something about CTS? Like, He's like, no, man, I, I got your number through um, Ben Sharp. And so we start chatting and and Ben Sharp called me first and he kind of pitched the idea to me. And I got, I got really excited with Ben Sharp because when he called me, I thought he was calling me because he wanted me to work out with Jen Valente again and like train with her and like, or there's some like hard training sessions or something like, I thought it had something to do with track racing. Sharp was, Sharp was the national team coach at the time, right? No, he wasn't. He wasn't. He was, um, he did work with Jennifer Valente. And so they had like some private sessions that they would do. Um, Sharp, Sharp is another guy that I kind of look up to. Um, and as even as a coach, um, like coach to coach, (laughs) um, it's a guy I look up to and, um, even as an athlete. Um, and, uh, so when I got the phone call from him, I thought he was calling me or something about track, but he's like asking me to switch sports. Mm-hmm. um to the sailboat racing i'm like what are you what are you talking about and he, he was like hey I'll, i can't really explain it but i'll have jim martin call you and i was like oh okay and i kind of just left it at that like we didn't really like talk much more about it and i was kind of annoyed because the amount of times i get called about switching sports and the, the reason why i get frustrated with the sports switching is i'll get called by like bob sledding or something and they'll be like hey you have X this and X that, and can you invest all of your time, you know, all of your money, pretty much what I'm doing in cycling. And it just felt like a lateral move, but it felt like I was quitting on cycling. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it didn't feel, and I had no passion for it. Mm -hmm. So then Jim Martin calls me and he's like, Hey man, like, you know, you need to do these power numbers and this, can you do that? And he mentioned it and it was like, 400 watts for 20 minutes, 500 watts for four minutes, 1300 watts for 30 seconds. And I was like, yeah, easy, done. Do it right now. Did that before breakfast today. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty much like, I, I can do that. That's, those are, those are, those are pretty much my numbers. Um, By the way, those are, those are true, like top quality Clydesdale numbers. This guy over here yeah. can't, can't even like <laughs> dream of that. <laughs> well, well, it gets, it gets, it gets better. It gets yeah. better. And I'm like trying to like play hardball, like, cause I'm just like so annoyed. I'm like, and, um, I don't know why I was annoyed. I was just a grumpy guy, I guess, but I, I just, I guess I was, thought it was too good to be true. And then finally, you know, I'm like, okay, maybe I'm a little interested in this. Like a month goes by and I get an actual call. And I was like, I told Jim, I was like, Hey, I just want somebody from the team to call me. Like, I think it's so weird that I have like a scientist calling me and then Ben Sharp calling me. And I got like people emailing. I had started having random people emailing me, um, like random coaches and be like, Hey, I heard about this. You should do it. And it it just seemed like something that was going to fall out by the wayside or like it didn't seem real. So then this coach calls me and he pretty much like he sells me on it. And I'm like, I'm like, so you're telling me I don't have to know anything about sailing. And he's like, no, like you don't have to know a thing. I just need you to have these power numbers. 
I was like, okay. And I ended up going to Belgium and I do this whole race series and it doesn't go very well. And I had kind of turned these guys down. I turned American magic down and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. And, uh, I, I, yeah, I pretty much fell flat on my face in Belgium and the national team coach was like, pretty much like, Hey, we're done with you. Like we're done. Like bike, bike racing in Belgium. Yeah. Like I'm in Belgium yeah. and I'm in Belgium racing my bike in Belgium and he's there too. And pretty much it's like, yeah, not for you, man. Hmm. And I was like, Oh, okay. Good so I call, I go back to my hotel room and I call the guy and I'm like, Hey, um, I'm starting to like, you know, wheel and deal here. I'm like, Hey, if you buy me a ticket there and then send me to the world cup after, because I had a UCI trade team and the off chance that the national team cut me, I would just go race by myself. This is me making opportunities for myself. Um, and, and so I was like, that was the only way that I could afford to go to the, the world cup. And so he was like, yeah, just come test and, you know, and, and, and we'll I'll send you the world cup. Yeah. But you just got to figure out your return flight back. And I was like, all right, that's a, their problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sure enough, I get there, man. And they're the coolest guys. It was such a, like such an awakening group of people like this. Unfortunately, it's some, some, some of the pro cycling culture that I started to feel on my tail end was, was grim. It was hard and it was just refreshing to be in a new group of people. Um, and uh, for a new sport and the guys were like equally as confused as I was like why we're here um, which is even cooler and some of them have never ridden bikes before and they were like testing on their girlfriend's bikes like they're rowers and they're doing like 480 watts or some shit for tw- 20 minutes and you're just like oh my gosh like it's it's unreal like in and, and these guys are just like is that good is that good like and they have no idea no idea. Yeah. And anyways, long story short, I ended up doing the test. Love it. And yeah, n- now they were like, yeah, you'll come out for two weeks. And that turned into two months. And then that turned into five months. Then me and my wife moved to Pensacola um, because I started to get sucked into it all. And, you know, long story short, I'm not just riding a bike on a boat. Like I'm involved in a few other things on base and doing doing some secondary roles as well. Um, helping with design and some other things, um, along with the team. And, uh, yeah, it's been a wild experience to say the least. It it seems wild. And I'd say too, for myself and also for our listeners, like, tell us your role, tell us like a a typical day, like what are you're pedaling a bike on a boat that propels it? Like, what the heck is your job? What do you do? Yeah, a typical day is is pretty much like, you know, we wake up, we go, we train. Um, and on a sailing day, we put the boat in the water, uh, which takes about an hour. Um, it's a big 75-foot boat, gets craned into the water. Um, then you pretty much go, you test equipment, you do a few race laps. Um, and long story short, like what I do is I move the hydraulic fluid, which essentially powers the boat for them to move the sails and what have you. And you're doing that on a bicycle on the boat, on a bicycle on the boat. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's crazy because it's, if you don't know a lot about the America's cup, I really recommend you go. There's like a documentary on Netflix, um, called the untold story Mm -hmm. of, um, I think it's like the longest race or something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. it's about John Bertrand in Australia when they won the America's cup. And, there's a lot of like secret top tech. Like there's things I can't talk about. Like there's, it's just and like, it'll all come out later, obviously. And there's things that won't come out, but it's, it's all, you know, these guys putting these teams together um, to essentially create the fastest boat within the rules. And then they challenge the, it'd be like, it'd be like if, you know, Filippo Ghana held a time trial race and a round Robin tournament where anybody could do whatever they wanted to their bikes you just had to race against him and it's, it's, that's kind of how it feels. And it's, it's so cool. Like if you get into like the aero tech, like I was getting into that in the tail end of my career and man, it is so cool. Some of the stuff that we get into and some of the like most like little nitty gritty things and it's, yeah, it's great. So when you're, when you're doing your job, when you're 
propelling the hydraulics around in this boat. Um, I, I mean, are you using some of these same like carbohydrate fueling and hydration concepts that you learn from bike racing onto the boat or are they like short efforts? I have no clue. So tell me. Yeah, for sure. No, it's, no. it's, it's kind of a mixture of stuff. It's like, um, I mean, yeah, we, we, because it could be long days out there and you never really know what you're going to experience. And so, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, I'm still eating like normal. Um, and honestly, like in that kind of training, I eat when I'm hungry and, and, and sometimes I eat a little sooner because I know if I'm hungry, it's a little too late. Um, and so I tend to, I tend to overfuel for sailing days. Um, just cause I don't know what to expect. Um, you could be out there all day. You could be out there. Something breaks with no wind, you know, um, it, 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 and it's a whole, it's a whole thing. So, but yes, it's, it, the, my day looks like gummy bears, PBJ, um, is pretty much my go-to and then hydration mix. And I, I'm not a big fan of like sugary hydration mix. I like, I like to keep my electrolytes separate and my foods mm -hmm. separate, unless it's like a massive ride, like road ride. But, um, for like racing, um, and, fueling purposes yeah i'm usually a gummy bear dude and a pbj dude yeah <laughs> fair um when you're out there are, are there periods of high intensity and then there's periods of long term or is it all high intensity yeah, with big breaks I can't, I can't really go too deep into this and the reason is because of our um i can't go too deep into this because of the systems that are being developed and yeah. we don't want to you know dive too deep into it but they are hard days it, we'll, it, we'll leave it there <laughs> yeah sorry um, yeah no because i think too the other thing and, and i know virtually nothing about america's cup but i correct me if i'm wrong it used to be like a uh hand crank uh yeah it was grinding crank propelled grinding and then yeah. the, the rule chain or the rule change or somebody started doing it on a bicycle and then they're like we need to poach all these cyclists and get them on our boat right well, so the way it happened, and it was cool to kind of like finally figure it out. So I was in, in you know, I know this is going to sound like I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but I was in T-Town, and there was Simon Van Beltov, and it was right before the Olympic Games, and he was on fire in the Kieran, like riding super well from New Zealand. He goes, he wins, he ties for third place in the Kieran at the at the Olympic Games, I think in Rio. And one the next year, I didn't see him. I'm like, where is he at? And they were like, oh, he... uh Signed with some sailboat team, Team New Zealand. Um, supposedly they're like bringing bikes on the boat. I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And they're like, yeah, he's like making bukus of money. And they're just like talking about like big crazy thing. And I'm just like, oh, okay, whatever. And uh, come to find out, you know, in the 35th America's Cup, they won because they had cyclists and because they had just a little bit more power because it powered everything on the boat and like even the boards coming up and down. So, if you're not familiar these are hydrofoiling boats so the boat is literally out of the water foiling and so the one of the boards like the windward board so with the way the wind is coming over the windward board would be up in the air they would power the hydraulics that would move that board and they obviously that doesn't happen anymore but when they won they actually banned cyclists yeah, because when you win you can make the rules and then everybody challenges your rules. Um, and then they won again. And now it's cyclist only. And so, or well, I think, I think you could technically use grinders, but they cut the crew in half. So it's like, a, like it went from eight grinders to now four cyclists or four grinders. And if you think about the amount of power that probably eight guys produce versus... Cause I think they were saying like some of the top end grinders, like they had a few top end grinders doing 400 Watts for 20 minutes and that's like top end, but like really the gold standard I think was like 330, 300 Watts maybe wow. with, with your arms, which is still pretty impressive. Um, super impressive. Super impressive. And so, yeah, um, that's, that's what it was in the past and now, so that's how that rule progressed more or less. And so your job, your, your job really entails or it favors absolute power production. It's not relative. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly. And, and, and we're still learning like, but 
at the end of the day, it's like one more watt. How do you like mm-hmm. it's and it's a weird thing for me because I I think I spent the last half of my career trying to figure out how not to do as many watts. Like how could I go faster without having to do as much watts? Mm-hmm. Like I didn't really care. Um like I'd always train hard, but and I would always do like big watts, but in a time trial I would be trying to figure out like if I was doing 400 Watts in a 10, 10 mile time trial, I'm doing something wrong mm-hmm. or it's up a hill. And yeah. that's, and so like, but now it's like, you, you, I need every Watt. How do I get one more Watt? <laughs> yeah. That, that's why I bring it up again in my limited knowledge of what you guys are doing on the boat and without diverging all of the information, it's like, yeah. it seems like the, the, the absolute capacity um, is what is desired, even though there's going to be time periods where you use all of it. There's going to be time periods where maybe you don't use all of it, but essentially the bigger the engines are that we have on the boat, yeah, the better it is. And there's no relative, like, I don't know. I don't think weight plays a huge role, right? Or it doesn't weight. Un- unfortunately, weight does oh, play a role because it's a uh, crew weight. Like, so you, there's a crew weight, um, but they have, yeah, they have guys weighing in at anywhere from, which is awesome, but anywhere from 93 kilos all the way up to, a, I, I think got to my highest at 108. So, um, so the you, weight considerations are not as particular as they are in the culture of cycling. No. And <laughs> it kind of goes towards the dirtier, um, like weight cutting things like sitting in saunas and things like that, which isn't, but we do a weigh in and then you just drink water right after and your class, that's the sport style. Um, and, and honestly, they'd probably rather, they'd rather you be bigger. So, yeah. So kind of more of the absolutes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I think we'll probably save maybe some of the, this, I don't know, even know if we can talk about your secret training for it, but, um, no, we can talk a little bit about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll save some of that, how you train, uh, for some of these absolute, um, and I'll just call it like anaerobic capacities. Uh, later in the next episode, because we are getting a little long. Um, but I do want to bring up the fact too, that like you've been the elite cyclist. Now you're on probably the the highest tier program of sailboat racing and you're a coach too. I mean, you still, um, you yeah. still work with athletes. So yeah. how the hell do you balance all that? <laughs> it is difficult. And I honestly got to say that I'm, su- well, on the, on the coaching side, I'm super lucky with the athletes that I have. Um, because, um, one, we, we mesh really well. Um, I'm also, you know, some coaches are different, um, and we all have different schedules, but I, because I'm so busy, uh, I open my schedule up seven days a week. So Mm -hmm. they can message me whenever, um, I, I, I respond seven days a week. I don't have office hours per se. Um, I try to give some flexibility there, but, um, but honestly, a lot of the athletes I've been working with, except for a few. Um, I've been working with forever the like the last two years or so. And so they're, they're, I think some of them might even be my biggest, like, like supporters, like they're supporting me, um, in my journey as well, which is really cool. And so, um, that, that side is how I support that. But, um, balancing it is, is really, I think it's cause I love it. I love, I, I just love it. I love getting on training peaks. I love seeing my athletes smash workouts. I love having the hard conversations too. Um, like they have a tough day. They feel like they fell flat. Um, how do we get through that? And I love navigating that. Cause I think, I think some of those days are some of the best days where you make the most gain. Um, and so, yeah, long story short, I think it's pretty easy to manage it all just because I love doing it. Completely agree. I mean, I, I've been coaching for quite a long time and I still, race and do group rides and do silly things. And, but in the end, it's like helping people solve that puzzle of performance is yeah. like the greatest Rubik's cube of all time to me. Oh, like every, everyone's a little different. There is nothing better than being with an athlete when like, as a first coach, like they're, you're the first coach they've had and like, they don't, they don't like fully get it, but they just know that their buddies have one and it seemed to work for them. And then you like, and and honestly, my favorite is when they don't fully trust you in the beginning. And you can kind of tell. Like, you can kind of tell that they like kind of go off and do their own thing. And you kind of have to, like, wean them back in. And you're like, hey, just, like, just feel me out on this. Like, just hear me out. Like, give me give me three months of just, like, your undivided attention. And 
as you can tell, that's like my sweet spot. I love, I love a three month kind of focus. And, um, and, and then they just smash it. They're like, they rip it to bits and they're like, Oh, it does work. It does work. Like, this is why I was doing why, what I was doing. And it it just kind of like, it's like a, you know, big light bulb. And that is awesome. I love that. (laughs) I love that feeling. I, I, I couldn't agree more with you there. So, um, I'd say let's let's put it there for the day, John, because yeah, I mean, yeah. your story is your story is super cool. I, I think that anybody that um, anybody that's had the challenges in life, especially like I'm a bigger person and I come to bikes, and it seems like it's just a bunch of skinny, like non-inclusive people that won't let me in on this group ride. How do I crack the code? I think somebody yeah. like you has cracked the code and exploded it. Yeah, for sure. And look, and, and, and I'm not the only one. I know there's definitely more out there and and sometimes they're hard to find, but um, if you are a listener and you feel like you need to lose five more pounds, you need to do this. I I, I would really encourage you to look at things differently. Um, Well, yeah, maybe the five pounds would help you, but let's, let's start to look at what else could help you as well. And maybe that five pounds can help you. Um, yeah. more than you think. And so that I, I would encourage you to talk to a coach on guiding you down that pathway um, and, and helping you process that a little better. Yeah. And I will, uh, I'll, I'll leave it with this is I would rather my athletes push more Watts and have more capacity first rather than go down the weight loss path. Any day of the week. Yeah. Any day of the week, because I can any do day. a lot more with that in the long run than just always going weight loss. So for sure uh, with that said, folks, make sure to tune back in next week on how to push more Watts, how to have more capacity and in particular anaerobic capacity. And John Kroom will be here uh, with me to talk about how to do that. So thanks again for listening and Kroomy. Thanks for joining us. No, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Cheers.